Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Coronary artery disease, or CAD. Now, that's when the major blood vessels that, that supply your heart with blood and oxygen and nutrients become damaged or diseased or clogged. Now, cholesterol-containing deposits, you probably know that as plaque mm-hmm. in the arteries, and associated with inflammation is usually to blame. And when that plaque builds up, that narrows your coronary arteries and decreases the blood flow to your heart. And, of course, that can cause symptoms like shortness of breath, chest pain, fatigue, etc. And if one of those or one or more of those arteries gets completely clogged, it can cause the big one, a heart attack. Not good. <laughs> the good news is there that, is good news. Yeah, there good. There is the good news is there's plenty that you can do to prevent and treat coronary artery disease. Here to discuss diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of cor- coronary artery disease is the division chair of cardiovascular diseases, Dr. Chet Rehal. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Rehal. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be back, Dr. Rehal. Nice to see you. Great so, to see you. Coronary artery disease still a major killer of Americans. It is. It's one of the leading killers of Americans, and if you couple it with stroke, it remains the leading killer of Americans. So it's something that we have made a lot of progress on over the past few decades, but we still have much more work to do. It, in, in terms of progress, uh, you're talking mainly about progress in treating the problem once it develops and not so much in uh, people aren't doing a very good job of keeping the cholesterol and the plaque out of their arteries, or are they? It's sort of both, actually. Since the 1960s, since the original Surgeon General's report, I believe in 1963, that identified smoking as a significant risk factor, smoking, rates of hypertension or high blood pressure have steadily gone down, and death rates from coronary disease have gone down. Now, the issue is that there are many other risk factors besides these two. You've mentioned one, which is cholesterol. There are many other things, such as our lifestyle, our diet, The prevalence of diabetes is increasing, as you know. There's an epidemic of diabetes in this country. Diabetes itself causes vascular disease, which affects the heart, causes strokes, affects the legs, et cetera. So we've replaced one set of risk factors with another set of risk factors. And because of this, we're seeing shifts in the pattern of coronary disease. So it's something that all of us need to be concerned about. So one of the questions that I often get asked is, what are the risk factors? And I say, gosh, just being born is a risk factor (laughs) because it's something we are all at risk for, whether or not we have a family history, whether or not we smoke, because it is so common for a myriad of factors. There are some things that can accentuate the problem, like high cholesterol, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, does it matter? Lifestyle. Does it matter if it's a hereditary type of cholestro- high cholesterol problem or one that you are eating high cholesterol? Does that make a difference? It does, actually. The hereditary types of high cholesterol are actually quite serious, and they, get, they give us basically super high cholesterol values, values so high that we can't bring them down just with diet, exercise, and our usual medications. Fortunately, there are new classes of medications that are given as injectables under mm-hmm. the skin that can reduce even that super high cholesterol. Um, Your other part of your question was about dietary cholesterol. So that um, also is is a problem, but we have to remember our bodies can make cholesterol even if we're not eating it. Our livers can make as much cholesterol as they want. So part of it is our genetic makeup, it's our lifestyle, it's our weight, and and all the other risk factors. Do I remember right that stress, if you're too stressed, that affects your cholesterol too? Am I making that up? Well, it, it's close. It's related. Stress is definitely a risk factor for precipitating acute coronary events. So, for example, it's not uncommon people who have a very high stress life or even an acute event to all of a sudden have a heart event, mm. you know, to all of a sudden have a heart attack or some other major problem happen. Because the stress, if you think about it, it increases the adrenaline, adrenaline levels in the body, affects the arteries, makes them constrict, and sometimes bad things can happen when that occurs. You know, it's interesting. Neither of you are old enough to remember this, but with the first Surgeon General's report in 1960 did not mention heart disease and stroke as being caused by smoking. It was lung cancer only. It was years later that the reports finally yes. came out that there was actually a correlation with heart disease and, and, and stroke. So it even it, it took longer. We haven't known that long, but it's interesting that you mentioned smoking right off the top. Yeah. Huge risk factor. It's a huge risk factor. We're fortunate that here in America, the rates of smoking have gone way down. They're in the teens. I'm always struck when I travel to Europe or Asia, mm. very high. Mm. 
Isn't very true? much, double, triple what it is here. All right, so we've talked about the, uh, the risk factors. Let's talk about the warning signs. What might you uh, feel uh, or notice that uh, should suggest to you that you ought to have your, your heart checked? Well, you mentioned some of these in your introductory comments. So the classic type of symptoms, the crushing chest pain, the elephant sitting on the chest, pressure or tightness when people walk, if, if people are experiencing those, that could be a real warning sign. The tricky part is that coronary disease can present atypically, particularly in women. And we as physicians have to learn to have our radar up when we hear these more atypical symptoms. What Sh are theirs? Could be sharp chest pain, it could be a feeling of anxiety, a feeling of weakness. It may not be the typical sort of central chest heaviness that male patients may get. So we really have to be attuned to, to the fact that it can present differently in different patients. And anxiety is a symptom I just heard you mention. I mean, that's something that a woman could talk herself out of and no, no problem at all. <laughs> I'm not, uh, it's not a problem. Yeah. And in fact, that happens. You know, we've seen many of our women patients feel that they, they have too much on their plate. Who's going to pick up the, the kids from school? <laughs> Who's going to make dinner for the husband? And they carry the weight of the family on their shoulders. I mean, many, many of our patients do, and they don't get checked out. Mm. But I think it's really important for our, our audience to recognize the fact that you have to be vigilant and you have to be careful about denial. How many of our own colleagues do you know <laughs> who have had shortness of breath for a few weeks or can't go up as many stairs as they used to or have a little bit of chest pain and sort of ignore it and deny that there might be something wrong and then have a heart attack? Physicians make bad patients. Yeah. I was going to say, I think there's a <laughs> saying that has to do yeah. with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so shortness of breath, uh, d difficulty going up and down stairs that used to be relatively easy for you, uh, fatigue, anxiety, yeah. all those things. All of those you you got to have your e ticker checked. And if, and if we came in and had those symptoms, what, what would you do? How would you figure it out? Well, so the first thing is we get a good consultation, a good history and physical, and then we do what's called a functional test. If patients are able, we'd like to run them on a treadmill with or without some imaging of their heart where we actually take a look at their heart and see how the heart is handling this activity level. And if there are severe blockages, these tests are very good at picking up those severe blockages in a non-invasive manner. And then that can lead to other things. And uh, certainly better to know up front uh, before you have the, the heart attack because if you don't get it treated right away, the muscle can die and your heart will never be the same, huh? Absolutely. We can treat heart attacks and we treat heart attacks every single day. We can treat them well, but it's better to prevent a heart attack than have to treat a heart attack. So let's talk about that prevention. We have just a moment left. What, uh, what are some good tips for prevention for us? So a lot of the things my mother used to tell me, maintain <laughs> a good lifestyle, you know, watch the weight. I think we live in a land of plenty and we tend to eat plenty. That's often the root cause of a lot of this. I've seen patients lose 40, 50, 60 pounds and then watch their cholesterol come down, their blood pressure come down, their high blood sugar melt away. So if we can maintain ideal body weight and have a, at least a moderately active lifestyle, that'll help with all the other traditional risk factors that I've just mentioned. Is that that 30 minutes a day kind of moderate activity? Absolutely. Very Even good. if it's just brisk walking, you don't have to be a marathon runner. And it's important to come in and see your physician fairly regularly, get those things checked, because if they are a problem, you can get them under control and prevent heart disease and strokes. Absolutely. There's a lot we can do, both, uh, uh, again, with lifestyle and, and activity, and a lot we can do with medications if necessary. All right, Dr. Chet Rehall, Division Chairman, Cardiovascular Diseases, Mayo Clinic. Great to have you with us. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you.